Good to see you. Let's start off with a bit of a weirdo. It's groovy in a far out, happening kind of way. One of Fender's great 60s freakouts that didn't last very long, but which makes it into most of the history books. But unlike the Paisley Telecaster of this period, this one doesn't see very many reissues. In fact, I'm not sure it would be possible. Yeah, this is a Wildwood One. A real wild one. Fender started making acoustics in 1963 with the aim to incorporate some of the best features of their electric designs into an acoustic guitar. Bolt-on maple neck, adjustable saddles, the six-in-line headstock. The top of the line of those early instruments was the King, which was soon renamed the Kingman, or Kingman, if you're on the Upper West Side. They gave some to Elvis. He played one in the movie Clambake. That's a film that gave us one of the linchpins in his catalog, a towering example of greatness. The title track, Clambake. The chorus of which goes, Clambake. Clambake? Gonna have a clambake. To the tune of Mama's Little Baby Loves Shortening Bread. Chills, people. Absolute goosebumps. So what's special about these guitars? What makes them wild? Special wood. Developed by a Scandinavian outfit, or so the story goes, they took European beech trees and injected dyes into the root system while the tree was still alive and standing, so that the color got carried around through the xylem along with the sap, penetrating it from the inside. Penetration being paramount. This could cause interesting gradients and hue variations depending on density and the flow pattern. Um, People used to do this with white flowers, like daisy. It was like a Victorian trick. You split the stem and put each side into a different glass of water with various colored dyes, and it changes the white flower into this weird variegated thing. It's actually difficult to find real documentation of this process. I looked. I haven't even been able to find the person or company behind it. You know, apparently they made veneer in Europe in the mid-60s. That's about it. Um, this is mostly guitar lore. It's in several history books and online, but unless you know someone who was in the procuring department for Fender in the mid-60s, we're not going to know more. They employed the Wildwood on a couple of electric models that are fairly well known. The um, hollow body Coronado and its base equivalent, uh, they use it on some of those. And they actually tacked on a pretty hefty upcharge as well for using this material. Um, at some point they renamed the Kingman Acoustic the Wildwood to take advantage of it. There were a number of uh, designations. This one is a one. The number refers to the color. Uh, ones are green, two is a bluish grayish tone, and three is kind of a gold bronzy color. The color can shift over time, of course, as does the lacquer that they put over top of it. So they tend to look a bit different now from what was in the original catalogs at the time of their release. This one is still fairly vibrant, um, almost radioactive looking but nothing compared to pictures I've seen. In the original catalog, they look like, you know, painter's tape. It's really green. These things were only around from 1966 to 71. I don't think they were made in huge numbers. They came about in a special time, riding the crest of a high and beautiful wave. Less than five years later, you could go up on a steep hill in Anaheim, California, and using the right kind of eyes, you could almost see the high watermark, the place where the wave finally broke and these mad Scandinavian colors rolled back. So, what are we working with? This really amounts to a setup, and as it happens, all these unique features kind of play into that. The action is... Mm, meh. It's pretty good on the treble side, quite high on the bass. It also seems like the board is kicked up a little bit at the very end. We'll investigate the shim situation in the pocket there. We might have to make a shim with a compound angle to take care of this discrepancy between bass and treble. The bridge is a dramatic piece of work. Nice chunk of Brazilian. The saddle thing. Uh, these aren't really designed to go up and down, I don't think, like a Strat saddle. They don't have the leveling screws. You could shim them up, and that might be necessary to correct the overall radius. Um, I don't think these are the original screws. They're flatheads and Robertson Drive. Um, the original is probably rusted out. There are numerous cracks. 
which have been glued and in some cases splined. I mean, you might be able to see in the reflection there that the super glue was cleared away with the swipe of a finger, thus obscuring the fingerprints of the perpetrator. We might be able to polish that up a bit, hide it better. Here's another piece of the Fender Acoustic Puzzle that didn't last long. They put in this odd dowel, which they called a resonator bar. It runs the length of the body in an attempt to keep it from folding up, I believe. Like um, a banjo dowel stick or a coordinator rod. Is it a good idea? Maybe. Does it make repairs more difficult? Oh, you better believe it. I've never seen one, but apparently Fender also made a sound hole pickup for these that clipped onto that rod. The relief is around 12 thousandths, which isn't too bad. I find it interesting how Fender would try and resolve the binding issue here, sort of cutting it off into space, and also carrying it over the end of the nut like that. Getting to the bridge pins is not that easy. And they're tight. Yeah, there's no springs in these, and uh, they really do rely on friction and the pressure from the strings above to keep them in place. Uh, they don't rise very far. Well, I guess they could, but... Yeah, there is evidence of some shimming. Well, that's a long screw. It looks pretty similar underneath. Now, here comes the fun part. Why, it's a fantasy world under there. That's a little different. There's a big metal rod. Must be part of the fantasy. The surface is uneven. There are crusts of glue. I'm sorry I didn't demonstrate it while the strings were still on, but there were some notes that were, you know, fretting out near the top end of the board. And this being a seven and a quarter radius, this is vintage Strat style radius. There's no leeway, you know. The smallest bend will choke out. So, got to take care of these. Um, dressing down those last few will definitely make things better. So I'm going to make the new shim longer, probably to a point just in front of this hole that uh, captures that cylinder that's embedded in the neck. It's an interesting, interesting idea. I'll start off with around 40 thousandths, which seems to be what it was like at the very end here, and taper it both in this direction and also towards the treble side. We'll see what that does and then we can adjust it from there. I'm marking the position of the end of the shim for reference. I'll get rid of the old one. Here I'm measuring the length. I'll cut a piece of veneer. I think it was birch to correct dimensions then trim it to shape but I need more thickness so I glued up a stack of them to account for the kick up in the end of the heel I'll dress some fall away into the last few frets I'll recrown and polish those they get progressively thinner towards the end now I'm working on the shim, tapering in two directions at once to account for the cant in the neck. We'll see what that does. The bright idea of having adjustable steel saddles that aren't adjustable for height is pretty counterproductive, really because you're forced to adjust the action with shims. And here I'm maybe five or seven thousandths of an inch off, and I've, you know, I've got to take everything apart to make an adjustment. Rather than simply pulling out a standard saddle and, you know, sanding a little off the bottom, or popping in my Allen wrench and giving some screws a twirl. So for all intents and purposes, this is non-adjustable for the average user. Also, with the shims, the thickness 
isn't the easy one to two ratio of working on a standard saddle because the shim is so far forward away from the fulcrum and neither of those are at the 12th fret. So it's sand a little, you know, reassemble, put the strings back on it, check it, disassemble, sand some more until you're frustrated enough to quit. And in terms of action changes related to humidity from summer to winter, you've got to err on the side of high for action. Because if you were to do this in the middle of summertime, give it to a player, have him take it home, you know, January rolls around and the strings will have sunk enough that, you know, what, what do you do? You can't adjust it without, you know, spending a day, basically. All of this back and forth thing so far, I'm on my fourth time. Um, I'm really trying to get the outside strings to the proper height over the frets. Proper action on those E's. Uh, let me get up close to the bridge. You can see the design of this bridge removes a whole lot of material right in the center here. It's routed away, leaving a thickness there of only about mm, 3 30 seconds of an inch, which is like 2.3 millimeters. Consequently reducing the stiffness as well, right in this area where the string tension is focused. And kind of predictably, um, it's bent along with the soundboard into sort of a reverse belly uh, in this area in front. And so rather than that fairly extreme seven and a quarter radius that we have over the fingerboard, the strings at the saddle are basically flat. So that's why I'm only concentrating on the outside strings. Any of the center ones here I'm going to have to fix by shimming up these saddles somewhat. I wasn't going to film this. There was not going to be much to see. This is a D28 from 1970. It's in pretty good shape. Only unusual thing is that it's been made lefty with the swell dual pickguard set up here. However, it had a little buzz. It's not fret buzz. It's a sympathetic droning buzz that shows up on a few notes in a few places. So I did the thing. I probed every brace, top and back, all tight as can be. I checked the tuners, checked the end pin, I made sure the guards were stuck down. One of them had a little loose spot, but it wasn't the cause of this thing. There was a very old, previous repair of a side crack. A strip of veneer had been casually glued in as a reinforcement. It was loose on the ends, so I decided to pull it out and then replaced it with more traditional cleats. It was still buzzing. There was a long crack in the fingerboard. Very tight. It was not movable. Uh, I put glue in it, leveled it, still buzzing. The nut was loose in the slot, like very loose, and the base E string was too low. So I glued on a tapered shim to the bottom of the nut and then glued that to the end of the fingerboard, like I do. Still buzzing. There wasn't quite enough brake angle over the saddle on the high strings, so I lengthened the string ramps a little bit thinking maybe a buzz could form if the strings were flopping around on top of the saddle um, while adjacent strings were ringing. Um, though I couldn't see it happening when I tried to test it. So we're really, we're into ghost hunting territory now. I looked at the underside of the bridge pad. This bridge here is actually a replacement. The bridge pad shows evidence of plugging in the string holes and a slight crack between several of them. I glued in a thin rosewood overlay, then I re-drilled and re-reamed the bridge pin holes. The bottom of the saddle was not flat. I was really enthusiastic about this one, so I flattened it out. And I also check the bottom of the slot that it sits in to make sure that was also flat. Still there. I can't think of another thing to do, short of disassembling the whole guitar and putting it back together. I was talking the other day about bad buzzes on commercial recordings, you know, where you can hear that the guitar needs work. Um, the one that comes to mind for me is the faces, ooh la la. You know, poor old granddad. I don't know which of the Ronnies it was. It was Ronnie Lane or Ronnie Wood. But one of them had a B string that was 
buzzing so badly because of a misshapen saddle that in any other context it would be unworkable, but it occupied a sonic space in that track that is just perfect. So this is for all those people who say they love to see me fail. I can't fix this one. It eventually took two shims to get the neck where I really needed it. One for the height and one for its attitude. Let's unscrew the fine pitch thread, about 60 turns. So these little barrels here are graduated in diameter to give you an appropriate radius, assuming the surface they were sitting on is flat. And from my perspective, it's never going to remain flat. I'll try and explain what's going on with the bridge. This viewpoint is as if you're standing in the sound hole and peering out over the rim towards the back of the guitar. The center of the bridge is warped downwards, so I need to make a filler piece that will level that out so those barrels have something flat to sit on. So besides having an uneven floor, there is a crack that runs through the pinholes. And I'm going to have to do something about that G-string. The slot uh, in the front here is wide enough that the ball end of the string is pulling up right through it. fill it with something and uh, man I I would love to pull this thing off and just make a similar looking bridge that took a standard saddle because this thing is way more trouble than it's worth. I'm filing the slot into a more regular shape and then I can glue in a scrap of rosewood binding which I'll trim off and then I'll re-establish the string slot. I've also glued up the crack that ran through the holes. So I'm going to plane the front surface of the bridge reasonably flat in here so I can glue in a plug. That'll give me a reference surface. You know, I want it, I don't want the dip that's in it currently. I want it flat to begin with and if I have to shim after that I'll, I'll do it. But um, it's just so undulating and stuff in here. To do that I'm going to use a half inch hinge mortising bit which is just a flat bottomed plunge bit. Um, this one has a bearing for following. I don't need that in this um, configuration. What's nice about it is that, that it's fairly short. It's half inch diameter. And I think it's only about half inch or five eighths of an inch long, which means uh, you can set it up in one of these um, laminate trimmers without having to extend the motor out of the housing. You know, it's just, it's easy. So I'm going to set this up so that it touches in the deepest part of the curve, right in the center. I'll lower the bit so that it uh, makes contact with the surface of the bridge there. So I'm not removing more material than I have to, but it's going to take away more from the ends of the pocket. And then I can shift this back and forth and get into alignment so that I'm cutting essentially parallel with the front surface of the bridge. That's just about to the correct depth. I'll pare away the corners and slice out the excess and make a slightly trapezoidal pocket for which I'll have to cut a chunk of rosewood to size. The ends are angled, of course, so I'm using a small sliding bevel to sight it, mark it, and then I'll trim it till it fits. The splay of the X-brace is decidedly narrow in this guitar, such that the arms of the X come very close to the outside pinholes, and the crossing is about here, where in a Martin it would be up here, and the arms would be over the very ends of the bridge. This makes things difficult, because in conjunction with the braces under there that we have to jump over, um, the reinforcement stick, which doesn't seem to be removable, you know, I thought maybe by unscrewing the strap button uh, it might come loose. You know, we've got a strap button on both sides, it's about in the right area, in the way that a national resonator is put together, but no such luck, you know. So the long and short of it is I can't actually get bridge clamps close enough to put pressure on this. 
you know, there's not enough space between the braces and the dowel in there. Um, I might have to resort to super glue again. Not my favorite, you know, or adhesive of choice anyway for bridge work, but at least in this case it's the leading edge and it's going to have plenty of downward pressure. Hmm. I just realized I can use um, I can use the strings and the downward pressure of the saddles to provide clamping pressure. Hmm. Problem solved. Of course that means I have to string this thing up for like the ninth time. Oh, and just in case you ever run into one of these things, the barrels here, they're non-reversible. They have angles cut into their ends, which uh, they don't mirror each other because of the slant on the, um, the screws here. So they have to go back in the same way that they came out. Sometimes it's not easy to figure out which way that was. I'm trimming the ends of the plug down, ensuring that there's going to be some radius to those saddles, even if it dips under string tension. The rosewood I used wasn't all that fancy, and even though much of it won't be seen when it's assembled, I decided to draw in some grain lines with some touch-up marker. And I put on a little bit of Danish oil and made it look like less of a sore thumb. There really wasn't a whole lot to be done with the cracks. I rubbed off some of the excess super glue and buffed them with some rubbing compound, but they're so numerous and the guitar has been played so heavily it's not much to be gained. All right, I hunted down some bum notes in the upper register here, leveled them as best I could, and recrowned them. But due to the kick up at the end, there is a limit to what's possible, short of refretting it and dressing that out of the board. Uh, I wouldn't do that, I don't think. Um, if this thing ever needs action work or something like that, I'd shake my head and decline, unless he'd let me pull the bridge off and make a standard one, because, you know, I'm not going to fool with this anymore. Um, the action at the end of the day is 6 64ths on the base side, which is a 25% improvement, it's pretty good. 4 on the treble, which is like a, I don't know, 12%. But to do that, I had to jump through so many hoops, it's laughable. I have to laugh to keep from crying. This is, until someone can show me an alternative, this is the single worst acoustic guitar bridge ever designed. It was destined to fail. Certain people in online forums are fond of saying profound things like, don't forget, the bridge is also a brace. And their acolytes will nod, yes, 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 guitar guru, I feel your enlightened embrace. But it's true. If you cut a huge chunk out of the center of a bridge, reducing its stiffness by, like, what, 75%? I don't know. The soundboard is going to do weird things in this area. And at which point it's going to need some action adjustment, but haha, -ha, joke's on you. A bunch of loose, hollow rings for a saddle of a pretty large diameter. What's that sound like? Sounds like an unplugged Les Paul Jr. Lots of zingy metallic warble in the sound. Um, and again, the bracing in this thing is weird, and it's totally inaccessible. You know, this was a guitar designed completely without repair in mind. In order to make it really work the way I'm accustomed to, I'd have to remove everything that makes this a wildwood, and that's not going to please anyone. So, you know, we do what we can. Let's put it to the test.